Ladies and gentlemen, please have a seat and let's, uh, let's get started. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Iman, and uh, I'm a research fellow at the University of Exeter's Environment and Sustainability Institute in the UK. I'm also a proud member of the ELEAP group of uh, young environmental um, and energy policy leaders. It's a network that's founded by the Atlantic Council and the Ecologic Institute, um, hoping to forth and shed light upon transatlantic issues, bringing young people together um, and forging recommendations for the future. So within that, I was also part of a breakout group, the, what is now known as the Axel Fellowship. And uh, this fellowship um, is a program that has allowed two fellows sitting here today, uh, Eleonora and Dayanita here in the front, um, to spend the past summer working in Washington DC and Berlin um, on Arctic outreach activities and learning how to go about spreading the word uh, about Arctic challenges, uh, Arctic issues, and connecting with young people uh, across the Arctic. So this event is in fact uh, a testament to the amazing international impact of their work uh, as well as that of the other Arctic youth groups that are represented here. So thank you very much uh, for all your work uh, over the past year. Um, this session is uh, going to be divided in two parts, and um, one of them will, will um, feature our guest of honor, Admiral Papp, who you saw this morning, but I think he's running late at the moment, so I think we're going to uh, go ahead with the second part. Um, and what we're going to do is, as you can see, we're divided into uh, groups, uh, themed groups at the tables. And the point of this session uh, is to have an open forum for discussion on youth issues. And when Admiral Papp walks in, we're going to have to cut it short, go to his question and answer session, and then return to your discussion. But for now, we'll start the discussion uh, at the tables. And the goal of this is to define youth involvement how youth are involved, what they can do to get better involved, and what non-youth, the rest of the community, can do to involve uh, youth further. So at the end of the discussions, and you'll be led by uh, designated le leaders at the tables who will guide the discussion a bit, uh, the goal is to come up with some recommendations, uh, policy recommendations, lifestyle recommendations that you can then uh, go ahead and forward to us, um, and we'll compile it, and the idea is to see uh, what are the, the threads that run through all of these major subject areas that you've been assigned? So if you could start your, uh, your discussions, and you'll have roughly 45 minutes unless we are interrupted, um, and then we'll continue just after that. So uh, please go ahead and start, um, and uh, I'll let you know how it progresses. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if I could have your attention, uh, we have with us uh, now Admiral Papp, who um, requires no introduction. You heard um, everything you need to hear this morning. Uh, if I could just say that for questions, uh, after he'll deliver a, a five or so minute uh, introduction, for questions, if you could line up uh, behind the microphone, uh, and we'll also be taking questions from Twitter. So if you're watching this uh, online, use the official hashtag of the conference, uh, and our fellows will uh, hopefully take some of your questions uh, from there. So if I could please uh, ask you all to put your hands together for Admiral Papp. Thank you, Ed. Uh, just so I understand the demographics here, how, how many of you are students? Oh, almost all of you. And uh, how many were at the opening plenary session? And how many were there when I spoke? How many stayed awake? <laughs> this is a treat for me. Actually, this is most forward to. I just uh, finished about a half hour uh, with uh, President Grimson. And, and I've been running between officials, we call them uh, bilateral meetings, uh, individuals from other countries, and they've given me an opportunity to do something today uh, because uh, everybody wants to talk to the United States as we prepare ourselves for taking over the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Uh, but I like to do sessions like this because it reminds me of when I was a ship captain. And uh, I always, as a ship captain, had the opportunity to go out and talk to my crew. And generally, my crew uh, were younger than me. Uh, they look at things from a different perspective. And while oftentimes I had to explain things, 
about the mission we're performing and, uh, and why we're doing it and how it fits into a bigger picture. Uh, more often, uh, they were wondering about how they individually fit into the picture. What, uh, what did this mean to them? And uh, what I found was that even though those, we call them all hands sessions, all hands, all the people on the ship get together and you talk to them, <clears throat> excuse me, but uh, what I found was more important was me listening to them because even if it's a question they're asking of me, in that question you often can discern a statement or an opinion or, or something like that. In fact, over time, I got to the point where I said, okay, so oh, are there any questions, comments, gripes, or opinions? And, uh, and oftentimes, you get all four of those categories uh, f from the crowd. Uh, but it always was beneficial to me because it told me about what's on their minds. And as a leader, you want to understand uh, what's going on inside the minds of the people that you're leading. Uh, I, I'm sure that all of you are confronted with decisions on what you want to do uh, with your lives and how you might serve and how you might help the Arctic. Uh, I just talked to, uh, uh, not too many months ago, before I commented on the Coast Guard, I went back to my high school and I uh, spoke to the students of my high school and one of the questions they asked me was, what do we do with our lives? And I guess the first response I had was, do something that you're passionate about. Uh, going to sea and being a sailor for me was always a passion and I have to tell you that I, I, I feel like I never have had a job in my life because in the Coast Guard, which I was in for 40 years, uh, every day was an adventure. Every day was something new and, uh, and I was very passionate about what we did. So it didn't feel like a job, it was more of a vocation, something that I really believed in. Uh, the other thing that I recommended to them that it, what, you don't have to serve or stay in a job or stay in a service for 40 years like I did, but do something at least in the short term to pay back your country, your community, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, all of us, uh, just uh, by virtue of where we are, being healthy, happy, educated, whatever it might be, and secure, uh, owe that status to other people whether it's the military, our teachers, uh, our government, whatever it might be. Uh, so why not pay back that system in some way, shape, or form? It doesn't have to be military service. It can be uh, other forms of government service, work within your community. Uh, but do something that serves other people. And, and I guarantee you, in that process, you grow, it strengthens you, it improves your character, and gives you experiences that are going to help you out in whatever you do for the rest of your life. So that's sort of general, general guidance that I try to give to uh, younger people uh, that I work with. Uh, more specifically on the Arctic, uh, one of the things that uh, we have done is I've gone, as I mentioned this morning, we've done some listening sessions up uh, in the Arctic. And this was not an original idea of mine. Uh, it was the organizers of my last trip. We did something called Week in the Arctic. Uh, it was, it's scheduled to visit three towns, uh, the towns of Nome, View, and Barrow. Uh, Barrow being the United States' most northernmost country, uh, uh, city, rather, and uh, Nome is a little south of that. Kotzebue is closer to the, uh, the Bering Strait, uh, but very small towns. And part of what we suffer uh, within Alaska uh, with our indigenous population, with our Alaska natives, is they have a hard time keeping the young people at home. Uh, oftentimes people will go off and they will uh, at a certain point have to go to college. Many times they go down to the lower 48 states. And when they see the opportunities and the uh, excitement and, the, uh, and everything else that the lower 48 has to offer, sometimes they just don't come back. What really intrigued me was a young woman in, I think it was Kotzebue, who talked about how uh, after a while down there, she realized how much growing up in Alaska had formed her and how much it had meant to her. And she brought her skills back to Alaska to give back to her community. Even though it took time, uh, she, uh, she eventually came back to that in terms of serving her people and serving uh, back in her community. But uh, it was this week of the Arctic that inspired me to start thinking about something we might do as a part of our chairmanship program. At each one of the stops in those three towns, they set up a youth forum. And in fact, I could not attend. 
I didn't, uh, they, they wanted it only to be the young people coming in and discussing the issues and the problems and the challenges that they're facing. And then what I got to do is I got to listen to the report out later on uh, in terms of what's on their minds, uh, what challenges they're facing, uh, what are their dreams and their aspirations for either their community or themselves personally. And it, it's very insightful. It's almost like what I talked about, those all-hands meetings, finding out what's on the minds of young people uh, because older people should listen to those things and help, uh, you know, because older people aren't the only ones that have good opinions. Young people have great opinions as well, and they have more at stake because they're going to inherit the world uh, that we're trying to manage. So that's why I'm very happy to be here with all of you, and I'm uh, going to be very happy to uh, listen to uh, your questions, comments, gripes, and opinions. Uh, just one more quick story that I would not be here if it was not for a decision made when I was about your age. Uh, I was facing my uh, choice of first assignment in the Coast Guard. I was graduating from our Coast Guard Academy, our college, and uh, we get an opportunity to pick where we go to. And it started out with the number one person in the class and worked its way all the way down to the last person. Obviously, the last person doesn't get a choice because there's only one job left by the time it gets to the last person. I was not last, but I was not far from last. And uh, we went through a couple of practice runs, and it looked like I was going to end up on a big Coast Guard cutter either in Boston or New York. But on the night of the, uh, the formal selections, uh, when I went into the room to make my selection, the guy coming out said, hey, Pap, there's one left in Alaska. Uh, so I said, Alaska, that sounds very exciting. Uh, and I looked uh, at the type of ship. It was the type of ship I wanted to be on. And it was home ported in a place called ADAC. And I said, I wonder where that is. That's ah, Alaska. It's, it's got to be exciting, and it's going to be an adventure. So I opened up an atlas when I got back to my room. And believe me, if you go into an atlas, it'll be about two pages worth of mainland Alaska and maybe part of the peninsula. And then there's an inset on the map that has the first part of the Aleutian chain. And then there's another inset that has the remainder of the Aleutian chain. And ADAC's about halfway through the second inset. And I said, that's not good. <laughs> And uh, it really wasn't good when I had to go home and explain to my fiance that we weren't going to be in Boston or New York, but we're going to be a little island called ADAC in Alaska. But she survived, uh, and uh, 40 years later, she's still with me. And uh, you know, sometimes the, uh, the choices that you make in your youth, while they might not appear to be wise or well thought out, uh, sometimes bring you to a position. If I had not gone to Alaska in that first assignment, I guarantee you I would not be here today. So it, it's good to be here today, and uh, I welcome your questions. Thank you. If you could line up um, behind the question. Cool. OK. Thank you so much for speaking with us. This is really awesome. Um, my name is Leahy. I'm a Canadian, but I study at Dartmouth College in the US. and. About two weeks ago, I was in Washington, D.C. for a high-level meeting as a note-taker um, of um, Arctic officials. And Julie Gurley, who's the senior Arctic official for the U.S., was there. And I was definitely the youngest person there. And I remember all of these, you know, older people talking about what they wanted to talk, what they wanted to do when it comes to the future of the Arctic and the U.S. Arctic Council chairmanship. And everyone mentioned millennials and young people and how young people care about the Arctic. Um, but they didn't really talk about how to directly engage us. Um, you know, youth, we're a third party, and these kinds of events are great, but again, we're in plenary hall talking to everyone who is here. We're on the outskirts. And so my question is to you, and I'm really hoping, I know this is a big question, but I'm hoping you have a more specific answer than what I usually get, which is, oh, we need youth. Um, how can, how can um, people such as you, um, how can we push um, elected officials to engage youth in a more tangential way when it comes to Arctic issues, not just, you know, 
on some kind of side event, but in some real way where we have a seat at the table. And also just looking around the room, you know, how can we engage indigenous youth? I think this is a great event, but I also feel like, um, myself included, many people here are southerners. And so how do we really engage the people who are on the front lines of these communities um, and are not as represented when it comes to the actual decision making and not just tokenizing us? Yeah. What, what province or town are you from? I'm from Montreal. Oh, ah, okay, great. Uh, well, first of all, you can't give it lip service, as you suggested, and what you have to do is actively get out there and seek counsel. Uh, once again, I learned it through my profession because uh, when, I was, when I had the crews of my ships, uh, generally most of the young men and women who were working for me were 18, 19, 20 years old. Uh, most enlisted people in the Coast Guard go right from high school and go to a boot camp and then come out. And uh, you have to learn culturally as well to help to understand them. Uh, fortunately, I had three daughters who oftentimes were about the same age as my crew members uh, that I was dealing with. So uh, uh, it actually, I think, helped me to be a better father because I was listening to uh, the young people in my crews and understanding a little bit more about my daughters. Uh, and. Uh, this is a practice that I carried for even, even after I stopped serving in ships as a district commander and even as the commandant of the Coast Guard. Every place we traveled, we would do all hands meetings. Uh, they were, uh, uh, more often than not, they were three, four, five hundred people in a room uh, with me responding to their questions and soliciting their advice and counsel on, you know, tell me what Tell me what I'm doing wrong about doing the Coast Guard or, tell me, or leading the Coast Guard. Or tell me what you think I could do better or what you would do if you were the commandant. My wife would do the same thing. She would go have meetings with their spouses and talk to the young women and in some cases now young men who are spouses to uh, women Coast Guardsmen and try to get into them. So you have to make a conscious and sincere effort. And many times it takes time to build up that sense, that bond of trust at one time. If I went out and I did that one time and never repeated it, people would uh, rightly say you were insincere about it and you don't really want to listen to us. But you have to do it with regularity. You have to go back and you, you, you have to uh, uh, be consistent in a conference or anything else. You have to ask that question and say, are we including the young people? What sort of venue can we have where I can listen to them? And uh, you know, sometimes because of the hundreds of things we're thinking about, sometimes we just need to be reminded. So become an activist. When you see leaders that aren't including you, ask why. And oftentimes it may be they'll say, gee, just didn't think about that. That's a great idea. And what do you suggest? How can we engage? And so you've got to pull uh, in it as well. Have an opinion about it. Be active. Cool. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Jared. I'm the Associate Executive Director uh, for the Youth Arctic Coalition. Um, so us kind of at our conception of the organization, we wanted to create a forum of communication and leadership for young people who live in the eight Arctic states. And obviously one of the realities that, that we realized going into the organization is that the Arctic Council is the entity in the Arctic, uh, kind of like we could use like a supreme entity in the Arctic. Um, so I asked this question to Vincent Rigby uh, earlier today, um, but I'd like to hear your opinion. How do you see youth getting involved in, in the Arctic Council? And kind of going back on your answer to the last question, why haven't they been yet? How do I see them becoming involved? Facebook. <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding. Uh, I found out when I was traveling around because I listened that one of the forms of communications between the villages up there is Facebook. They want to know what their tribe, what their neighbors, what their family members are doing, and they, are, uh, they have found Facebook to be a, a great venue for doing that. Herein lies the challenge, though, and uh, part of the thing that the Arctic Council needs to address, and this is one of the things on the United States agenda, is connectivity. Uh, if you go up to the villages that I just went to, uh, when I went to Kotzebue, for instance, uh, there's no fiber optics. Uh, they're still relying upon microwave off satellites to, uh, to communicate. Uh, when I went up to Barrow, uh, I talked to a woman up there. They've got a, they've got a modern hospital that was built, but they don't have a lot of uh, technicians. So she had to go in for a CAT scan 
They don't have a technician that can read the CAT scan there in Barrow, so they have to transmit the data. It took three hours to transmit the data, something that should be done in five minutes or less. It took three hours to transmit the data because they had to go uh, beam it off a satellite and down into the lower 48. Shell oil, uh, another example. When they get out there on their ships and they were drilling and they were bouncing around, they would lose microwave connection to the satellite because the satellites are not optimally positioned for the high latitudes, so you lose your line of sight and you lose your communication capability. So we're, part of our project is uh, uh, telecommunications. How do we improve it? Uh, one big thing is going to be to get fiber optics up through uh, mainland Alaska so that we can start getting people able to communicate better. Uh, we all know, I, I have, uh, and it's been pounded into me by my daughters, that that's how people communicate nowadays. I mean, uh, texting and everything else, that really wasn't my bag, but I've had to get into it if I want to talk to the young people that, uh, uh, that I deal with. So uh, social media. Uh, is a big thing, and I think that's the thing that we should leverage more so that we can keep uh, people involved, particularly uh, in the villages in the far north. Thank you. Speaking of which, I think we might have a question from the, the web. Actually, I have a question. Sure. <laughs> that's okay. Um, hi, thank you so much for addressing us today. Uh, my name is Dayanita, and I'm an Arctic Climate Change Emerging Leaders Fellow um, based at the Atlantic Council in D.C. Ah. Um, and so earlier today, um, during your a speech at the plenary, you mentioned um, about wanting to help improve living standards. And so uh, my question is uh, about how, you know, whether this is part of the, um, the U.S. chairmanship that's coming up, how you plan to, you know, engage with indigenous youth, you know, in parts of Alaska that have, you know, health and sanitation issues. And, um, you know, my table is discussing food security. Um, and subsistence hunting, which is being threatened because of climate change. And, um, you know, is this just um, an education problem? Is this something, you know, that, that younger people in those regions can be, you know, can they just learn training? Is it something like that? So, thank no, you. No, I, I think it's a, uh, it's part of it's a resourcing issue. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's not just, we have already identified the problems. Uh, part of the challenge that we have, and, and I've listened to many groups up there now, uh, we have villages where there's no running water, uh, where they have to pump water. Or if you have running water because <clears throat> you can't, uh, you, you have to keep the lines heated uh, in order to keep water running. Uh, you have uh, concerns about the permafrost and running things through it. So you have to insulate the pipe so it doesn't melt the permafrost, yet have heating inside the pipe so it keeps the water flowing. It becomes tremendously expensive. When it becomes expensive, people don't want to use their water because then they get a huge water bill. Mm -hmm. So they don't use the water, they don't wash their hands. And if you don't wash your hands, we all know what happens there. You have communicable diseases. Uh, so fresh water, proper sanitation, uh, and uh, how do we come up with uh, reliable, renewable energy uh, for many of the villages that we up have up there? Uh, so we're going to advocate for uh, pilot projects uh, with uh, small scale, small grid, uh, sustainable, whether it's wind, thermal energy. Uh, what we need to do away with is uh, diesel generators running constantly, uh, producing black carbon and, uh, and very expensive to run because of the costs of fuel in Alaska. And I, and I think that's applicable across uh, the, uh, the peoples of the north. And uh, there are some places where they've had successful either wind energy or, or combinations of solar and wind and whatever. And uh, we want to advance some test projects there, as well as surveying the water situations throughout the Arctic and seeing what we might be able to do to come up with a better way of providing uh, fresh water for our people. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, thank you so much for your presentation. It's been really interesting. Um, I'm Jess Newman. Um, I'm a student at the Harvard Kennedy School, so it was great to hear that you had been there recently. Um, so my question is, I guess, around female leadership um, on Arctic issues. When we looked at the panels that were presenting this morning, very interesting, very excellent, disproportionately male. Um, so I guess I'm thinking, as the U.S. assumes kind of leadership of the Arctic Council, how do you plan to kind of promote and engage female leadership and female youth leadership? And, and I guess to kind of preemptively push back, I know when we had the first question about how to get youth involved, you said part of the answer was saying, well, why am I not involved? And when I think about kind of some of the reasons why women aren't engaged in leadership, it's a lot of time because they're not culturally comfortable asking that question. 
Um, and so I guess my question is how, how do you think that the U.S. leadership and future leadership at the Council can proactively engage women in a way that kind of surpasses tokenism? Wow, there is, uh, well, believe me, in my life, I see no tokenism whatsoever. Uh, first of all, let me introduce uh, Ms. Hillary LaBelle, uh, who is one of my Arctic advisors. Now, I've never asked Hillary her name, but, or her age, rather, but she's, she's young. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we just, uh, I, I guess I would say, I'm gonna, I, this is going on on the web, so I might get in trouble, but we stole her away from <laughs> EPA. Uh, but uh, for good reason. Uh, she had been selected uh, at a very early age in government service, once again, going back to serving, paying back. Uh, she was working, uh, I, I said EPA, I meant FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency. Uh, within the Department of Homeland Security, my mistake. But uh, she was selected as a presidential management fellow, and she went and she spent some time working at the Coast Guard on a detail. <clears throat> she happened to be at the Coast Guard. I was leading an effort to produce the Coast Guard Arctic strategy, so she had some, uh, some input there. Uh, then she did a second detail to the State Department. She was working at the State Department when I arrived, and because of her background at Coast Guard, I believe they put her in, in our polar division and was working uh, Arctic affairs as well. So it seemed to make sense to me that uh, uh, with all this Arctic experience, it was going to go to waste if she went back to, uh, uh, to FEMA. So uh, that is not tokenism. That is appreciating the value of the intellect and the experience and picking the best person for the job. Uh, and I don't know whether it's because I have daughters or because the Coast Guard's been very progressive in terms of women. Uh, the, we were the first service academy to admit women. Uh, at one point uh, during my time as commandant, uh, I have my wife, I have three daughters, two granddaughters, my vice commandant, the number two person in the Coast Guard is a woman, the, uh, my boss, the, uh, the uh, secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano is a woman, uh, the, uh, the Deputy Secretary, Jane Lute, was a woman, and uh, my uh, primary care physician is a woman. I mean, I'm, I'm surrounded by women. My wife says it takes that many women to keep me in line. But uh, I, I, I think, to be fair, there are a lot of people who, like me, believe that we go for the best person. Do we sometimes give people an, a little bit more of an opportunity to open things up to women in non-traditional fields? Yes, we do from time to time. Uh, but we uh, generally always go for the best qualified person. Uh, within my office, I'm the only guy. I've got uh, Hillary, and I brought a woman over from the, the Coast Guard uh, who was a civilian employee who uh, was my strategic planner and scheduler, and she's now my chief of staff. Uh, over there. So, and, and to me, I don't really even think about it being men or women. It's just that I've got the best people and they happen to be women. Good. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. So, unfortunately, just one final question, um, please. Hello. Thank you for addressing us today. Um, my question is about education, but I should give you a little bit of my background to frame this first. I am doing a master's degree here at the Reykjavik University in sustainable energy engineering, but I was born and raised in the Yukon. So I would be not really indigenous because I would be uh, shot down for saying that, but I am from the north. And, uh, and you're, I, you address this sort of uh, the education issue, but not with any answers. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm obviously not in Canada or even in the Yukon doing my degree. I've come all the way to Iceland to do this. And, and my plan is to go back, but for so many of us, we don't. How is the Arctic Council going to address the education issues in the North during the U.S.'s chairmanship, or are they? Is this going to be something for a later time? Uh, you know, it's, it, I, I'm going to be completely candid with you. It's something we have not discussed, but it's become a, uh, an area of interest to me. Not necessarily education. Uh, what I'm finding out, there are a lot of young people who leave the villages to go get the education. The challenge is getting them to come back. And that's where this sort of spirit of service, sacrifice, and giving back to your community comes in. The woman that I told you about uh, that was in one of the sessions uh, that I attended uh, during the week in the Arctic, uh, it just clicked for her at, at some point in time that, uh, you know something, I, I had it really good back in the village. The, uh, the character and, uh, and life lessons I learned were passed on to me by my elders. 
I can take what I'm doing and I can go back. Uh, wasn't that, an, oh, you weren't with me. I'm sorry, Jen, Jennifer was with me on that trip. Uh, I, I, my recollection is she, she's a uh, um, certified uh, practical nurse and she went back to give back to her community. She could have made much more money down in the lower 48 and had all the, uh, that the lower 48 has to offer, but she chose to go back to her village and, and help and give back. And uh, as I said, at the end of the day, at the end of our, our lives, uh, what we really want to do is to be able to look back and say, how do we contribute? Uh, I would ask you, chance, uh, Google or look up a song called uh, American Anthem and listen to it. It's uh, the original version I heard is by uh, Nora Jones. And she sings it in a very slow and, uh, and, and lovely version. Uh, I kind of like the way the Coast Guard Band and our vocalist does it, but it's my favorite song. And uh, in the first verse, it uh, ends up asking the question, what will be my legacy? What will my children say? And then the chorus answers the question, let them say of me, I was one who believed in returning the blessings I've received. Let me know in my heart when my days are through. America, America, I gave my best to you. I, I get tears in my eyes whenever I hear that song because I've known so many young people who step forward and volunteer their lives in service. And at the end of the day, when we look back and we reflect, are we going to be proud of what we did? Uh, you know, a lot of people have a lot of money in the bank and, and possessions. Uh, but what do we have, what have we done that's made a real impact on the lives of others and for the betterment of our country or, or the world? And that's the question I would pose to all of you. What are you going to do? What will be your legacy? What will your children say? Thank you very much for having me in here. Sorry, sorry we have one, actually oh, one more okay. question because uh, one's come in uh, from the World Wide Web. Um, so off uh, Twitter, the question is, uh, is the administration going to work on a more concerted push for new icebreakers? <laughs> there must be a Coast Guardsman out there uh, yeah. sending that in. Uh, well, that goes back to my previous career in the Coast Guard. And uh, yes, uh, I can't speak for the current, the new commandant of the Coast Guard, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that he is pushing just as I did uh, for the United States, for the uh, administration and the Congress uh, to uh, come up with a wherewithal to uh, fund the construction of a new icebreaker. Uh, we have one relatively new icebreaker that's about 16 years old right now. It's, uh, it's a medium icebreaker, but our two heavy breakers that we use can use in the Arctic or in the Antarctic because you know we, we're focused on the Arctic, but the United States has responsibilities in the Antarctic as well. We have scientific uh, programs down there that require resupply, breaking into McMurdo Sound each year. And uh, right now, we've only got one icebreaker that can do that, and it's 35 years old. Uh, the other 35-year-old icebreaker is laid up at the pier in Seattle because we don't have the money to renovate it. Uh, what we really need to do is be about the business of buying uh, an icebreaker uh, estimates are it will cost about a billion dollars, but uh, you know, Navy spends about six, seven, eight billion dollars on an aircraft carrier, and we've got uh, eleven or twelve of those. Uh, I would think we could find one billion dollars to build an icebreaker to be able to take care of our responsibilities in the Arctic and the Antarctic. But that's a selfless advertisement right there, and I thank whoever sent that question in. <laughs> thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be in here. Admiral Pop, I think I speak for all of us uh, in saying that this has been a real, real highlight uh, of our day and worth even the trip to Iceland just to be at this uh, session. So thank you. And one thing you said earlier today, most Americans don't really consider themselves uh, as coming from an Arctic country, it really points to the fact that outreach is perhaps one of the most important ways forward, as you said, and that's exactly the role of our Excel Fellowship as well as all the youth groups here. So thank you so much, and I think we're aligned in our views on... Um, thank you. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, if we could uh, wrap things up with the discussion now, 
and if you could, uh, each, each table could pick uh, a rapporteur, and uh, if they could go up to the microphone, and you have five minutes maximum to tell us what your topic was and what you've been discussing, what are the key issues uh, that you'd like to present to the rest of us, and a few insights from there. So would uh, this table like to start, health and food security and indigenous peoples? Hi everybody, um, so our table discussed um, health and food security and we kind of focused on that subject specifically um, about indigenous peoples um, since so many indigenous peoples across the Arctic um, depend on subsistence hunting as you know, a part of their culture and as part of their society. Um, and so we focused um, actually on Russia um, and Alaska and kind of compared first, um, you know, try to understand uh, the, how these indigenous groups fit within, you know, the state and their relationships to, you know, the, the government and legally, you know, like, um, you know, exactly, you know, like kind of where, uh, like, <laughs> sorry, I'm just kind of losing my train of thought, but um, just basically, you know, how, um, you know, state relations are and, you know, what kind of benefits they receive if, if they're indigenous and whatnot. Um, and so actually we're going to, I'm going to pull up one of our uh, members of the group who is from Alaska and he can talk a little bit more in depth about, um, you know, specifically indigenous people in Alaska. Hi there. Uh, my name is Weston. I work for the Alunit Corporation, which represents the people of Wainwright, which in so many ways, if this is the shape of Alaska, we're right here next to Barrow. Um, we're a native armed subsidiary. It's a, a full native uh, community and, uh, I normally sit at the energy table, but with the indigenous peoples actually not being indigenous in my corporation, it's actually the owners. Um, kind of our company's responsibility is to bring those opportunities. Um, but we talked that in depth, and really I could sit up here and give you guys a dissertation for about two days on this. But um, one of the successes, and I grew up in Alaska, that I've really seen with youth, youth and indigenous people is actually uh, ANSEP, the Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program that's run. Um, they do a series of internships. Um, they get youth from the communities out, and not just the main hub communities, the small communities, such as Akasuk, which is located in, 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 there's nowhere Alaska, and then there's a little bit further nowhere Alaska, and that's where that community is. Um, and, and the challenges they have there, for instance, gravel is extremely hard to get a hold of, right? So how do you build infrastructure? How do you make change when you don't have the basic uh, resource of gravel to put in footings or pads or extend your runway. So you can come up with a lot of solutions, but focusing it back on the youth, it's taking the youth from those communities and, and getting them into education programs in science and engineering, but also into trades and different things like that, so that each person can explore what they want to see as success and potential. And uh, just in Alaska is kind of a unique, unique situation at the moment, too, because um, in a lot of ways, we're still a discovery channel to the rest of our country in some ways when people are trying to understand our roles, uh, deadliest catch, things like that. Um, but we actually have a very sophisticated system. For instance, Arctic Slope Regional Corporation is a $2.6 billion company that provides opportunities and things like that. So um, that's kind of my perspective here. I'm getting the one minute. So. Uh, hi, I'm Eleon Eleonora, the European ACCL Fellow. So I, um, with my with, with my fellows from the Security and International Co Cooperation Table, we really touched up upon some key uh, some key issues of uh, se se security in the uh, Arctic. So first of all, we all convened that. Uh, 
security is really a multi, um, multilateral and multidisciplinary concept. So it's very hard to give just one def def definition from one single point of view of this term. There are various aspects that should be uh, taken into account, starting from um, econ economic progress, pol political stability, and then we need uh, to look at infrastructures, uh, climate change, and uh, another set of uh, issues, health, uh, food sec security, and so on. So obviously, we, we should not look at the uh, national and inter international level only when it comes to uh, Arctic se security. But obviously, these two, these two levels are sometimes, uh, are sometimes key to solve um, key sec security issues. Um, a very important point that I would like to um, bring your attention to is that we, uh, we stress that we need to ensure that this new frontier of our world does not become uh, an area of like, conflict. So uh, it, is, um, it is somehow the best, the best example of international co cooperation in the, in the world right, right now. And uh, we should try to keep it ha as it is uh, when it comes to sec security. So this is a bit to sum up uh, some points of our di discussion. Thanks so much. Um, so we were discussing uh, what was described on our table as, as kind of a contradiction in terms of many ways, and I think that made the conversation difficult, which was environmental stability and climate change. Uh, but I think we, we were able to, to, to touch on a few points which I think are important. The first was that a lot of the issues that you have to talk about when it comes to this are, are related to adaptation and how communities, especially northern youth, have to adapt and change the way that their lives um, and their kind of ancestors' lives have, have worked. And so. Um, I think one message that we discuss is how does that look and, and how is, as youth, both northern youth and, and, and other, can we can share some of those stories which are so, so powerful in, in terms of actually helping people realize whether they're in the Arctic or outside the Arctic, what the effect of some of, some of those actions is. So that was the, the first point we talked on. And then the second point I think we talked about a little bit was the, the danger that can exist with youth movements in terms of of being kind of put to one side as a result of maybe a lack of preparation or a lack of professionalism when you're talking to, to policymakers. And so I think the biggest thing to avoid as a youth organization or as a, as a youth group is kind of being put as, a, as having to deal with, deal with you rather than work with you. And so we are talking a little bit about how that can, uh, that can be done in, in, a, in a way that really leads to some constructive uh, policy changes. Um, and I don't think we, we got too far along because I think the time, time ended, but uh, I think going back to those, those ideas of sharing those really meaningful stories, I think is, is something that we thought could be, could be really powerful. So that's what we discussed in the uh, environmental stability and, and climate change table. So us at the table here in the middle, uh, we kind of hit a few different topics. Uh, on, our, on our ticket there it says education, uh, employment and youth participation, which can kind of be linked together but at the same time are, are very different, uh, different realities and different subjects. One of the first things that we kind of realized at the table, and the senator from Alaska had said this earlier today, is that there are kind of two Arctics in the sense that uh, the Nordic European countries, oftentimes youth who are trying to get involved, there's more opportunities for them uh, to get involved in their communities, there's more opportunities for them in, in that education sense where they can kind of stay in the region, uh, get an education um, at, uh, at a collegiate or at a university level and then go back home. But then we see the other side of the Arctic, that's the North American as well as the Russian Arctic, where sometimes when we want to get involved there isn't that means. Uh, to get involved in our community and there we see events where youth are involved but it seems to almost be a token youth like oh you're a youth thank you for coming out uh, but we need to feel as young people that the people who are working with us actually want to work with us and want to listen to us and then in regards to to the to education we started talking um, more on that 
North American Russian side where just the logistics of education becomes so difficult for certain students that they don't continue and they can't pursue that. Uh, so we are talking about the North Slope, the North, North Slope of Alaska uh, that's going through their curriculum and trying to find a way uh, to mix traditional knowledge and traditional cultures into uh, their education system and try to derive away from uh, a Western education. Uh, and then we compared to certain other regions that are doing similar things, trying to get youth um, to become passionate about where they're from and hope to get them back to where they're from to, uh, to make careers and to make lives at home. So my table talked about energy and the Arctic. Uh, we kind of had a bit of a discussion at the beginning about what is, what does it mean? What are we talking about? So what we came up with was there's both huge opportunities for energy exploitation and, and uh, you know, both oils and fossil fuels as well as huge opportunities for renewable energy uh, infrastructure in the Arctic. And there's huge challenges in establishing that infrastructure in, in parts of the Arctic and obviously challenges related to climate change caused by energy exploitation elsewhere. So uh, some of the challenges that we kind of focused on how bringing energy to the uh, regions of the Arctic that don't have it and how that relates to um, the seasonality, lack of infrastructure, uh, and then the economic issues for the North American and Russian Arctic, these are huge challenges, obviously. And, uh, and you know, you, we had people at our table from Alaska and then myself from the Yukon, and we have these challenges where, you know, the, yeah, the youth are leaving, but it's partially because there are no jobs to come back to because the, you know, the exploitation of uh, the jobs, the economic opportunities are still um, only beginning to be realized in the, in the North. Um, and our kind of summary there at the end was that, you know, it's about connections, it's about connecting people, it's about connecting uh, the infrastructure and, and putting these things together so that we can move forward with both, you know, establishing uh, energy for these communities in the Arctic and, uh, and realizing the economic and, and uh, potential there. Thank you all. Thank you. That was uh, that was very insightful, and uh, this event has turned out um, to be an incredible uh, stepping stone for us as we uh, decide on how to shape our future programs and whom we can work with in the future. Uh, you guys have really um, outdone yourselves uh, in terms of ideas and enthusiasm. Um, I'd like to say that this idea of the two two Arctic's. Uh, is a very interesting one, and I think that at a forum like this, it's also important that all the countries are represented uh, that should be. And um, some countries, as you've noticed this morning, have been much more prominent than others. Um, and I'm a Swedish citizen, uh, and uh, personally, I think that Sweden should get more involved in uh, this conference in the future, but also uh, similar ones. Um, so I encourage all um, countries to get involved in issues that are uh, truly theirs. So we're going to have to wrap it up now, I'm afraid. Um, for me, this has been amazing to watch simply because the uh, Excel Fellowship came out of literally nothing. And um, it was a session like this, a breakout session, where we uh, came up with some ideas. We had some funding on the side, and we competed for it initially. Uh, and the idea of an Arctic outreach project was brought up, and we took it from there and over the course of one year developed it into having two uh, human beings, in fact, um, living their, changing their lives for three to six months and learning so much about uh, the Arctic, about the people there, about all the issues they face. And I think that this is exactly the kind of thing that we should all keep on doing. And as we heard earlier, the importance of outreach is just, um, it's one of the most important uh, ways by which we can uh, move forward, especially as Arctic youth. And I think uh, having met uh, many of you and especially um, the leaders of your organizations, um, that's the feeling I get. I'd also like to thank all the sponsors we've had, both for Excel but also for the ELEAP group. And they include um, the Allianz Foundation for North America, the Robert Bosch Stiftung, 
The European Union, of course, has been crucial uh, in funding and supporting ELEAP over the past three years since its inception. I'd like to thank all the youth groups here uh, and their organizers. It's been a pleasure to work with you today, pleasure to meet you, and I'm sure we'll be doing this again soon. Um, and finally, of course, I think we all owe it to uh, organize, um, to, to, we owe it to the organizers of this conference uh, to, um, to thank them for putting, us, uh, putting this together, to letting us have this big, beautiful room, uh, and for bringing us uh, here today. So thank you so much, and, uh, I, and, and, uh, and, our, um, <laughs> and Dayanita says, please stay in touch with us, um, stay in touch with our fellows, and uh, stay in touch with all the organizations up here, because uh, I'm sure that we'll be seeing each other again. Perhaps it won't be a youth session next time that we're all sitting in a room together. So thank you so much for coming, and uh, see you again very soon.